Tog didn't create the toxic environment at Bank of America Merrill Lynch. He simply perpetuated it. This past Sunday's New York print edition of the New York Times carried an in-depth article by Kate Kelly, a link in the article here on that. On the toxic environment at Bank of America Merrill Lynch, pointing the finger at Thomas Montag for creating it. Kelly is a good investigative reporter and deserves praise for outing this current conduct at the firm. But Montag, the president of Global Banking and Markets, has only been with the Bank of America Merrill Lynch since August of 2008, a period of less than 13 years. The toxic environment at Merrill Lynch dates back half a century. Let's start with the Helen O'Bannon case. In her book, Tales from the Boom Boom Boom, link in the article here for that. Author Susan Antila describes the personality test that Merrill Lynch gave to prospective brokers in the 1970s. O'Bannon, who had a master's in economics from Stanford, was asked to answer the following question on the test. Which quality in a woman do you consider most important? One, beauty. Two, intelligence. Three, dependency. Four, independence. Or five, affectionateness. If the job applicant answered intelligence or independence, no points were given, while an answer of dependency or affectionateness scored two points. One point was given for beauty, and Bannon had answered intelligence. She was denied a broker a training spot at Merrill Lynch. O'Bannon sued and received a settlement of $10,000 in 1976. The kind of broker Merrill Lynch, Merrill Lynch apparently had in mind was someone like Michael Stamenson, who played a hand in bankrupting Orange County, California, in 1994 by selling its complex securities that imploded but made plenty of money for Merrill. Uh, Stamenson was immortalized in evidence produced in the Orange County court case as the star of Merrill Lynch training tape for rookie brokers. On the tape, Stamenson outlined the attributes to be a successful broker. Quote, the tenacity of rattlesnake, the heart of a black widow, spider, and hide of an alligator. End quote. As the evidence against Stamenson and higher ups at Merrill Lynch mounted in the Orange County court case, Merrill Lynch settled the case for $400 million and sealed the documents. It also paid $30 million to the county to settle it and abruptly end a grand jury investigation leading to allegations of foul play. Over the last half century, Merrill Lynch has been repeatedly sued for sexual harassment and discrimination, including a case brought by the federal government's Equal Employment Opportunity Commission in the 1970s. That suit was also settled in 1976 and had alleged, alleged uh, a pattern and practice of discrimination in Merrill, Merrill's uh, recruitment, hiring, job assignment, promotion, uh, testing, and maternity leaves, uh, leave of policies. Between 1998 and 2013, Merrill paid nearly half a billion dollars to settle employee discrimination claims. Uh, quote. Okay. And, uh, according to an earlier report in the New York Times, uh, in Ed Tillis' tale from Boom Boom Boom, she cites studies conducted by psychologist Louise Fitzgerald, an expert on sexual harassment and discrimination of women. Fitzgerald had con contacted 1915, uh, <coughs> 915 women who had filed sexual harassment or discrimination claims against Merrill Lynch and received 643 usual, uh, usable responses. Among the respondents, 37% uh, said they had been touched in a way that made them feel uncomfortable, while only 1.7% said that the person about whom they complained was punished. Fitzgerald says in the book that the rate of sexual harassment in Wall Street's brokerage in industry was higher than it was in the military, for God's sake, and that's kind of amazing. It's not amazing if one considers that Wall Street is the only industry in America that has been allowed by Congress to create it and run its own private justice system, overseen by a deeply conflicted self-regulator, FINRA. <laughs> What has changed in the culture of Merrill Lynch over the past half century is that the settlements happen more quickly so that the media doesn't get hold of the story. Kelly reports in Sunday's article in the Times that in some years over the last five years, Mr. Montage's divisions confidentially settled about 15 complaints annually with employees who made credible allegations of misconduct or working in a toxic environment, according to someone who was directly involved in handling those matters. Kelly shares um, the following as the many examples of a hostile and unfair environment. Quote, in 2017, a junior woman on uh, one of the bond trading desks complained about male colleagues grabbed, uh, complained after a male colleague grabbed a plastic curling iron out of her bag and joked that it was a dildo, according to a complaint described to the Times and three people with knowledge of the episode. The woman, who, was okay, who had occasional informal interactions on the trading floor with Mr. Montag but was multiple levels subordinate to him, was granted a settlement, the people said, end quote. 
uh, doing the heavy li lifting to keep the toxic culture of Merrill Lynch out of the news for the past four decades has been the monster public relations outfit, Burson Marsteller, uh, known as Burson Cohn and Wolf, or B -sub BCW. In 2009, Rachel Maddow called the company the PR firm from hell. She summarized its history as follows, quote, When Blackwater killed those 17 Iraqi civilians in Baghdad, they called Burson Marsteller. When there was a nuclear meltdown at Three Mile Island, Bob Cock and Will Cox, who built the plant, called Burson and Marsteller. The government of Nigeria accused of genocide, genocide in Biafra, Burson Marsteller. Philip Morris, Burson Marsteller. Silicone breast implants, Burson Marsteller. The government of Colombia trying to make all those dead union organizers not getting in the way of the new trade deal, they called Burson Marsteller. End quote. Prior to his death at age 98 in 2020, Harold Burson, a co-founder of Burson Marsteller, who served as its CEO for more than 35 years, published a book in 2017 on his career. The book, The Business of Persuasion, includes an insightful look at the symbi symbiotic relationship between the firm and Merrill Lynch. Burson writes that Burson Marsteller's professional relationship with Merrill Lynch was near seamless. Was We collaborated more as a team than as a client and agency. Burson indicates that he personally worked with six consecutive CEOs at Merrill Lynch over the almost four-decade period. Don Reagan, Roger Burke, William Schreier, Dan Tully, David Kamansky, and Stanley O'Neill. Paul Critch Critchlow, who became the chief uh, public relations officer at Merrill Lynch during that period, came to that spot directly from Burson Marsteller, according to Burson. Uh, there are folks on Wall Street who believe that the invisible hand of Burson Marsteller may have played a role in drawing back a dark curtain around the criminal charges that the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission, FCIC, recommended bringing uh, against Stan O'Neill, uh, Merrill Lynch's, or Merrill's CEO, and uh, <coughs> Jeffrey Edwards, uh, Merrill's CFO, in the aftermath of the financial crisis of 2008. FCIC voted in favor of making a criminal referral of these two men in October of 2010 and relayed a detailed memorandum to the Justice Department. Read the full memorandum here, link in the article. The FCIC relayed, uh, relayed its a final report to Congress and the public on January 27, 2011. Unfortunately, the public knew nothing about this criminal referral of Merrill Lynch execs and other Wall Street exec executives. Uh, link in the article about that until March of 2016 when the National Archives and Re Records Administration finally released thousands of sealed documents from the FCIC's work.